uh, Bagavi uh, tell us about some of the work she's been doing. Uh, she, um, several of you uh, know Bagavi anyway, because uh, Bagavi's worked with some people at AI2, uh, students of Hannah's. She's finishing a PhD uh, next quarter, hopefully, if things go well. Uh, and um, yeah, it'll be really interesting to hear what you what you've been up to, by Gabby. Um, so thank you, and I'll pass over to you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Peter, for that introduction. Um, yeah, I'll jump right into my talk, um, and I can stop for clarification questions if there are any uh, in in the way. Um, yeah, so uh, hi everyone. Uh, today uh, I'm going to be discussing my work on reliability and interactive debugging for language models. So just in the last year, we've seen a rapid boom in the number of large language models that are coming up from industry and academic labs, both open sourced and access through API calls. And concurrently, we've also seen an exponential growth in the number of users that are actively interacting with these models uh, with a wide range of prompts and queries. Um, a large proportion of these prompts include technical queries or prompting the model for creative content. For example, users are asking models to generate creative content like making up new recipes or software engineers are using them as pair programmers that can help them debug and complete code. At the same time, users are also finding that these models often have some recurring issues. So they often generate repetitive and misleading nutritional advice, possibly because they're amplifying biases in the underlying data. They also generate a lot of errors and hallucinations, uh, which could make them more vulnerable and more likely to be misused. So it's important that we build large language models to be more reliable to the millions of users who are interacting with them. Um, but the main question is, how do we specify reliability? So I argue that there are multiple aspects of model behavior that could make them more reliable to users. Um, in this talk, I specifically focus on those aspects that a lot of different users care about, including ML experts, domain experts, and the more general users interacting with these models. So let's get into some of these aspects. Millions of users are prompting new and complex tasks to these models. Um, they're prompting them, for example, to handle bash commands or booking airline tickets for them. So one very straightforward aspect of reliability that users want is for models to be accurate on new, diverse, and increasingly complex tasks, but with as few labeled examples as possible. And this also means that the model should be capable of some intermediate reasoning to solve this, solve such complex tasks. Secondly, because models are pre-trained to maximize the likelihood of the next token, they amplify biases or correlations in the data. So phrases like um, juice cleanses or weight loss pills are more likely to co-occur with weight loss advice. So beyond accuracy, users want models to be robust to such correlations and training data. Users are also more likely to trust the model's response if it comes with an explanation. Uh, if they are being prompted, let's say, for a medical diagnosis, users want to be able to get the model to explain why it's predicting a particular medical condition. So they want models to be transparent, typically through human understandable explanations. And finally, users want more interaction with the model. So they want them to be able to probe this model so that they can understand what's wrong with it and how they can improve the model. And the specific kind of interaction or debugging that users do depends on the model and the task that we are looking at. So if we are looking at classifier models, which are very commonly deployed in many applications, um, the errors made by the model on the test examples are uh, what users could examine in order to debug the model. So for example, um, Researchers have found that image classifiers misclassify tennis rackets if they don't co-occur with players. And they were able to debug this by obscuring parts of the image. So in this talk, I'm going to cover some of my work on how we can train models to find such systematic errors that users can then examine. 
On the other hand, um, generative language models like JackGBT or Palm, they are able to interact with users over several turns. So now users could actually debug them in conversation. For example, um, here's a math word problem that the model initially gets the wrong answer to. In this case, the user could once again prompt the model and steer it to generate step-by-step -step reasoning to solve the problem. Um, the model is able to revise its response and get to the correct answer. I will cover some of my work in this space where uh, models are prompted to explain their predictions uh, in order to improve their accuracies. But model interaction capabilities don't stop here. Um, what lies beyond the horizon of generative models? So we now have language models that are not only interacting with users, but they're also interacting with other utilities like search engines or APIs. I refer to these models more generally as augmented models. So let's take a more complex arithmetic problem. In this case, um, the augmented language model could interact with a state-of-the-art code generation model or Python that can accurately solve the problem. And then it can be very transparent about this secondary interaction when it responds back to the user. So in this case, the, mod the user could debug not just the generation, but also the tool and language model interaction. I will cover my recent work in this space on automatically augmenting the model and getting users to debug uh, tool and model interaction. So as these examples have shown, um, being able to interactively debug the model improves user trust, but it's also closely related to the other aspects of reliability that I just mentioned. So over the course of this talk, I'll highlight how my work uh, improves on multiple aspects of reliability across a range of models and tasks. I will also end by highlighting some future directions about how we could build more reliable and interactive models. So let's get into it. Uh, I'll start with uh, describing a technique to identify systematic errors in classifier models. Um, in this work, we are tackling dataset bias, specifically with the goal of building a more robust model. So classifiers are perhaps the most commonly used models uh, in a lot of uh, applications. Um, they commonly consist of a pre-trained encoder, uh, like BERT-like models or OpenAI clip for images, um, which are then further fine-tuned on supervised data for the task. Now, typically, while these models may have limited interactive capabilities, users can actually get a lot of valuable information from the errors that are made on the different test examples, especially if these errors are categorized into some semantically meaningful slices. And we want to be able to identify such slices in data. So to do this, we, first, we must first understand why such systematic errors happen in the first place. So models like classifiers are typically trained with empirical risk minimization, which basically reduces the average training loss. Um, and ERM assumes that data is unbiased. So the different slices of data, which I'm showing here with different emoji shapes, are uh, assumed to be identically distributed both in training and test data. As a result, their average test losses in the beginning are almost equal. And over the course of training, the loss over all these data slices decreases almost identically. But training data doesn't always look like this. For example, in the NLI uh, sentence pair classification task, contradiction class examples that contain negations like never or not are more likely to occur uh, in the hypothesis sentence in the training data. But we also have entailment class examples that have negations in the hypothesis. So this slice of data in the test set can have high errors. And um, the model has learned to basically correlate negations with a particular label like contradiction. Similarly, for the task of classifying uh, you know, celebrity pictures as blondes or non-blondes, um, blonde smiling faces are more popular in the training data. So once again, the model learns to correlate smiles with blonde hair. So a slice of data consisting of smiling non-blonde faces tend to have high error rates. And data sets can have multiple biases. So the same uh, classifier also learns to classify all 
people who are wearing eyeglasses as non-blonde. So more commonly, data distribution actually looks like this, where some slices of data, like rare emojis or some of the higher data slices I just showed you, are underrepresented. And um, as a result, the loss over these underrepresented groups starts out unequal. And as training progresses, the test loss doesn't reduce as rapidly for these groups. And I refer to them as error-prone groups. So if we, uh, if we know that there are such error-prone groups in the data, we can divide training and test examples uh, into predefined groups based on what features the model is exploiting. And once we have this predefined group assignment, we can then adopt an intuitive, robust optimization strategy uh, to help improve results on these groups. And to do that, what we could do is select examples from a small proportion of these predefined groups that have high loss in every batch, and then minimize loss over just those examples from the selected groups by increasing their contribution to the batch loss. So this is a kind of min-max optimization technique uh, referred to as group distributionally robust optimization, or group DRO. And it ensures that as training progresses, um, the loss over all the groups has now decreased identically. This means that the model is now going to make fewer mistakes on the error-prone slices. But the big challenge here is, how do we apply this technique to a new data set or task where we don't always know beforehand what features the model is exploiting um, because uh, we don't know what biases potentially exist in the data. And so we don't have these predefined groups to implement the group DRO algorithm. So in this work, we propose an adversarial slice discovery and optimization technique. Our approach is going to discover error-prone slices, but with no additional supervision and simultaneously also train a model to be robust to these discovered slices. Users can then examine and probe these discovered slices to find potential biases or spurious correlations that the model put is, is exploiting. So to do this, we train a dedicated grouper model uh, whose task is to discover these error-prone slices. Now, the input to the grouper model is, a, um, uh, is typically text and image representations that we get from a strong pre-trained encoder. But instead of assigning each training example to a specific group, the grouper model learns a soft distribution of groups over the training data. So for a given number of groups, G and an example X, the grouper is going to predict the probability that example X belongs to any of these G groups. Without explicitly training this grouper, this is how the average group loss would look like over training and test data. Now, because we are using pre-trained features as inputs, um, this leads to a grouping that is semantically meaningful. So a lot of the images that have uh, common features are likely to belong to the same group. But this kind of grouping is not informative with respect to task loss and model errors. So our goal is to train the grouper to make use of task loss effectively. So to do this, we develop a novel adversarial training objective. It basically mirrors the min-max object, group DRO objective that I just talked about. Um, but it acts adversarially. So here, based on the current group assignment, um, a small proportion of groups with low loss are selected. And then the parameters of the grouper are updated so that examples will get shuffled around and the resultant group assignment maximizes the loss of examples that get assigned to those selected groups. So this kind of adversarial objective results in some of these error-prone examples that have common features getting assigned to a small set of groups that have high loss. For example, the model tends to assign um, misclassified images of blonde women who have their hair tied up uh, into one of these high loss groups. So now that we have this adversarial group assignment, how do we train the robust model? What we do is simply train the classifier with the same group DRO objective 
um, that I laid out in the background uh, work. But instead of using predefined groups, we now have we now use our discovered groups. So the result of this process is that the loss over all the discovered slices also now it decreases uh, identically. So we evaluate our approach on three different classification tasks that have multiple known error-prone slices. Um, we use this information to evaluate how well our approach does on known model biases, but we don't use this information to train our model. We compare our approach against ERM that has been uh, ER, an ERM model that is trained for more epochs. And we also compare against an approach where group DRO is being used, but for predefined groups. Finally, we compare against a heuristic approach for slice discovery, where it's this is a very simple baseline where the examples get divided into two groups based on a threshold of their loss values. The caveat with this kind of heuristic is that it's not going to find size slices that are semant semantically meaningful. So we compare all of these robust optimization techniques uh, on whether they can improve accuracy on the error-prone slices in the different uh, data sets we are looking at. So this chart reports the performance of all of our approaches on uh, all the different error-prone slices that we are evaluating on across the three data sets. And we find that our approach, Agro, uh, matches the ERM uh, approach or the heuristic group assignment uh, across tasks as well as across multiple error-prone slices in a given data set. And we hypothesize that using semantically meaningful slices, which are also informed by group loss, uh, or sorry, model loss, is key if you want to improve robustness to multiple data biases. We also find that our approach is within 5% of using group DRO, but with predefined groups. And this is noteworthy because in our approach, we are not using any additional supervision to find these error-prone slices. Our approach also allows users to examine the discovered slices for potentially new spurious correlations or biases that the model may have learned. So in the celebrity uh, hair color classification task, we discover some new slices that were not characterized before. For example, blonde women who were wearing hair accessories or hats or had their hair tied up, typically playing a sport, were all being misclassified by the original ERM model. Users can then interactively debug these slices to further analyze the potential biases the model may have learned. So in the case of multi-NLI, we discovered a group where the premise and hypothesis contain words that are antonyms of each other. Uh, like the premise contains the word behind, the antonym contains, uh, sorry, the hypothesis contains the word front, so in this case, what users could do is perturb the entire slice uh, to analyze uh, the potential bias. So for example, uh, the antonym words could be replaced with the same or synonymous word that is in the premise. And we find that the ERM model's prediction flips 80% of the time back to uh, entailment. So this kind of perturbation analysis helps us um, interact with the model to confirm a hypothesis about some potential bias that the model is exploiting. So to take away, um, our approach improves robustness to known biases, but without explicitly using supervision about the biased feature. And users like domain experts could actually examine and perturb the different discovered slices to identify new biases that the model may be exploiting. So I'm now going to turn to a different aspect of reliability, which is transparency in model predictions. I will focus on generative models and show how we could prompt these models so that they can explain their predictions. So pre-trained generative models like GPT-2, T5, or BART are able to interact with users over multiple turns. Their initial response to a user prompt could be then followed up with another prompt to which they have to respond to based on the context so far. Now, these models have improved massively on downstream tasks. And in particular, uh, their remarkable performance on common sense reasoning tasks is worth studying more closely. 
So let's look at these two examples from the Winograd Schemas Challenge. Um, the GPS and map helped me navigate home. I got lost when the mask turned upside down. Because Brett found an internship while in college, but Ian wasn't able to, mask found a job less quickly after graduation. The task is to figure out which of the two highlighted noun phrases the mask token may be corresponding to. Both these examples require the model to read in between the lines and use knowledge that is implicit and not present in the input. For example, it needs to figure out that the electronic GPS technology is more robust to a change in orientation compared to a physical map. So we want to investigate what is the implicit knowledge or reasoning the model is using to get to near human performance on this task. Now, instead of analyzing some of the parameters and model internals, which can range to a billion parameters, we actually leverage the fact that we could extract reasoning from the language model by prompting it with an appropriate follow-up. So what could this follow-up be? To understand this, we turn to how humans explain their decisions for such tasks. We conducted an in-house pilot where 10 annotators were asked to justify their decisions for Winograd with a short reason. Um, and we found that in a majority of the cases, they chose to contrast the two ambiguous noun phrases using some differentiating attribute. An example of contrast that they created was that maps can be turned because they are handy while the GPS is fixed to the dashboard. Our findings are also complemented by research in psychology and cognitive sciences where they find that when people are asking for an explanation for an event, what they're really looking for is um, an explanation that is relative to some alternative outcome. So based on these insights, we propose a novel contrastive prompting format to extract explanations from a generative model. Firstly, prompting is inherently interactive because the users are debugging, debugging the model in conversation. Secondly, this prompting format is founded in what users expect from model explanations. So let's dig into how we do this. We obtain several such contrastive justifications from the human annotation task over 100 different examples. And these examples are then used to construct a database of contrastive prompt templates. Specifically, we abstract away some of the input tokens and retain templates that occur more commonly in um, the human data. And we use these curated templates to prompt the model for contrastive explanations. So given the original input, we first convert it into a fluent neutral input using a mass language model. For example, uh, in the maps instance, we replace the mass token with the pronoun it. We then partially fill in the contrastive prompts with the different answer options. Um, for example, maps can be mask while GPS is mask is the context dependent template. So these templates together with the neutral sentence are used as input to T5 and BART models, which are capable of infilling multiple mask spans in the text. So an example of uh, contrastive knowledge that the model generates is that maps are paper-based tools while GPS is electronic technology. So now that we have these contrastive reasonings or explanations from the model, how do we evaluate their quality? To do this, we uh, use these explanations to solve the original task. So during inference, um, the different completed contrastive explanations are appended one at a time to the original input. And we measure the likelihood of this full sequence for both the potential answer spans being present in the mask location. And because we are using multiple such contrastive templates, we aggregate the different likelihoods across explanations so that we can select the most likely answer. So we evaluate our approach on three different Winograd schema data sets as well as an MCQ task for physical and spatial common sense reasoning. Um, we compare our approach against an inference strategy which uses no additional reasoning, just the input. 
We also compare against an approach where the model doesn't receive any prompt template and has to generate text in an unconstrained manner given the input. Lastly, we compare against some of the most relevant prior work called self-talk, which uses clarification questions to get additional reasoning from the model. So in the internship example, the model has to complete this clarification question, what is the purpose of? It then has to reply to its own question uh, with the phrase um, to help people find jobs. So what is the purpose of the internship to help people find jobs? So these kind of clarification questions could extract relevant knowledge from the model, uh, but it may not always be useful to solve the Vinograd schema's task. So we evaluate task performance um, uh, to measure how useful these different uh, generations are from the different approaches that I talked about. And we find that um, unconstrained generation uh, doesn't do any better than have an, in than the no reasoning baseline. Uh, contrastive explanations, on the other hand, um, obtain the best performance across the different tasks and data sets we looked at, uh, even improving over self-talk. Uh, we hypothesize that contrastive prompts are potentially able to extract knowledge from the model that is more task relevant than simply asking clarification questions about entities in the input. What's particularly noteworthy is that we use BART large to get contrastive explanations, which is smaller than the GPT-2 model that was used in the other uh, uh, baselines. Furthermore, we, when we switch out BART with a T5 model that was trained on more data, or a larger T5 model, our um, approach does much better. And this potentially implies that a stronger language model will benefit from contrastive prompts, uh, potentially because it's storing more common sense knowledge in its parameters. So to take away, um, prompting the model for additional reasoning makes its prediction more explainable. And it also allows users to probe the model interactively. Um, secondly, uh, as our experiments indicate, uh, it also improves the model performance on common sense reasoning tasks. Now, before I jump into my final work, um, I'd like to highlight some interesting recent work from the community that actually combines my ideas from my first work on uh, finding error-prone slices and then prompting the model for contrastive explanations. So specifically, they develop a technique to describe differences between two text distributions. So let's say we are looking at two text distributions, one that contains negations in the hypothesis and one that doesn't. Um, they are able to fine tune a GPT-3 model that can generate this difference or contrast between the two distributions. So the model, for instance, could generate the statement that distribution one contains negative adverbs. Um, and this way, the model could actually provide an initial hypothesis for what the biased feature is between um, a biased data set and a non-biased data set. So I'll now talk about uh, my final work on use on how we can get augmented models to improve zero-shot generalization to more complex user tasks. So models like GPT-3 or PALM, which have over 100 billion parameters, um, can learn in context without actually updating their parameters. So one very successful uh, in-context learning recipe is chain of thought prompting, where the output is detailed in a step-by-step -step process to get to the answer. And when this is demonstrated to the model via a prompt, the model can also generate this kind of step-by-step -step reasoning to get to the final answer. And this strategy has proven to be very useful to solve arithmetic tasks. But while this chain of thought prompting strategy can work on simple arithmetic, um, we found that it fails on calculations that involve more number of steps or larger numbers. So this is where an augmented model could come in. So let's say we, uh, we consider that complex arithmetic problem that chain of thought got wrong. With augmentation, the language model could potentially interact with a state-of-the-art code generation model, uh, prompting it to generate Python code to solve the problem. The code generation model is able to uh, generate an accurate step-by-step -step solution in the form of Python code. The model could then interact with the Python interpreter, which executes the code that's generated in the previous step and gets to the correct answer. 
So let's say we are trying to solve a new task now, a physics-based question answering. This brings up a couple of challenges. First, what's the sequence of sub-steps that can make it easier to solve this new task? And second, which of these sub-steps require what tools and what the inputs and outputs to these tools should be? So generally, we want to augment a powerful language model like GPT-3 to use an arbitrary set of tools and solve an arbitrary set of tasks out of the box without actually having to update its parameters. So we propose a framework for automatic multi-step reasoning and tool use, or ART for short. And this framework allows the model to generalize to unseen complex tasks. It enables the language model to be augmented uh, for arbitrary tools out of the box. Once again, the framework also allows users to examine and debug the language model tool interaction to improve accuracy. So our framework solves new tasks by de decomposing them into multiple steps. And optionally, it can delegate some of these sub-steps to the appropriate external tool. So after every new sub-step is generated, Generation is interrupted so that a tool can be invoked if required. And the tool output is then concatenated to the generation so far, and generation then resumes. And this continues until we get to the final answer to the problem. So this decomposition into sub-steps as well as the interaction with tools is formatted like a, a software program written in high-level language in the form of sequential instructions and function calls. Um, so this is an example of a program for an arithmetic uh, or math word problem. Um, it consists of a task instruction, um, solve arithmetic problems using Python code. This is followed by the input to the uh, uh, task. In this case, it's the math word problem. The next part is the decomposition itself. So here, the different sub-steps are named and numbered. And each of them has an input and an output. So the input to, for example, the code generation substep would be um, write down arithmetic as Python code, as well as the original math word problem. And the output of this substep is the code snippet that is returned by the OpenAI Codex model. The, fin the, progr the program finally ends with the end of uh, program token and the final answer. So art decomposes new tasks using in-context learning with few short examples. And this happens in two stages, planning and execution. In the planning stage, um, art retrieves similar programs from a library of task programs. And then these similar programs are used as demonstrations uh, to the language model. In the execution stage, the language models generate step-by-step -step reasoning to solve the new problem. Um, and some of the intermediate steps could potentially involve um, calling different tools. So how do we build the task uh, or program library? We use a subset of tasks from Big Bench. Um, specifically, if we focus on four skills that are important to over half the tasks in the benchmark. These include um, searching for more information, arithmetic reasoning, programming, and free response generation. And we focus on how we can get unseen tasks to learn these different skills. So we construct a library of over 15 different tasks from Big Bench, spread over the different skill categories. And for each of these tasks, for a few instances, we author programs. For example, that arithmetic program that I showed you belongs to the arithmetic category of uh, tasks. So task programs typically use one or more tools. In this work, we focused on using the Google Search API, code generation, and code execution. Um, programs contain demonstrations for how to use different tools. So a program that belongs to the search category would demonstrate how uh, a query can be issued to the Google Search API and how its results can be integrated back into the program. So uh, the final missing piece is how do we select uh, programs for the language model. So typically, the three most similar task programs are selected. And this selection is also done using in-context learning. So to 
to to do the in context learning here we basically compose an in context learning prompt as follows the task is that you're given a description of two ta of two tasks and you have to output whether the two tasks are similar along with a reason so positive pairs include tasks that are from the same skill whereas negative examples would include tasks from disparate skills so two skill two tasks from the search skill are positive examples because they both require information lookup whereas a task from the search skill and from the uh, code debugging skill for example would would be a negative would be a negative example so when a new task is posed to this framework um we iterate over all the task uh, library instances and um prompt the model for pairwise decision for the new task um we select the three most uh, similar tasks from the library and use them as and use their programs as demonstrations in the execution phase so let's look at execution a little more closely let's try to solve that high school physics question answering task um the word problem here is how do we find the horizontal component of force in the planning stage the most similar tasks were retrieved from the search category and the arithmetic category and their programs were used as demonstrations to the language model so during execution the first step generated was um to search for information the model interacted with google search to look up the formula for the horizontal component of force next the model generated the substep code generate which triggered a call to the open ai codex model the code generation model used the input as well as the search result to basically substitute uh, values in the formula and get to the correct answer finally the language model generates the substep execute code and this triggers an interaction with python which executes the code that was generated in the previous step and this is the answer that is returned by the model so we evaluate our approach on 19 unseen tasks from big bench as well as a different benchmark mmlu and we compare our approach against um few short learning where we are showing the model inputs and outputs of the new task the other baseline we compare against is where the model is not shown input outputs but is just shown um the input along with the phrase let's think step by step and this forces the model to generate multi step reasoning uh um, but because there is no human supervision involved here we refer to this as auto chain of thought so we report um our results based on the different skill categories that we looked at but this information wasn't used by our our framework for learning the new task the blue bars here show results for few short prompting for the different tasks um where many input output examples for the new task were used but what we want to do is to generalize to a new task without having these input output examples just using the input to the new task so how does auto chain of thought do the auto chain of thought approach underperforms the few shot baseline potentially because the step by step reasoning in auto chain of thought could be noisy since we are not using any task specific supervision there our approach on the other hand um, outperforms both few shot as well as the auto chain of thought baseline across the different skill categories we looked at and um, on the mmlu benchmark and it's important to note that we are able to generalize uh, better to a new task with nothing but the task input and some similar programs now once again the programs that are generated by our framework can actually uh, be shown back to the they can be shown to the user who can then interactively debug these programs so we run an in-house pilot where the participants were shown five different instances of the new task where our framework got the wrong answer uh, what the expected output was and what were the different programs generated by our model users can then edit some of these subtasks or add additional subtasks and tool definitions so in the physics qa example they found that the answer often gets rounded off or as a unit of measurement so they added these two new sub steps round up and add unit these edited programs were then used to prompt the model for the for the physics qa task 
And we did this for a bunch of different tasks and found that um, the there was an impressive performance gain over all the test tasks where we conducted this pilot with just five additional instances annotated by humans. So to take away, um, our framework substantially improves zero-shot generalization to more complex user tasks uh, with uh, augmentation and tool use. And users are able to intervene on these generated programs to further improve results. So, so far I've covered uh, some of my prior work on building accurate, robust, and explainable language models. I want to discuss some ongoing and future directions that are exciting to me. So we've seen that the interactive capabilities of models have grown massively in the last year or so. And this growth is not going to stop here. We're soon going to be looking at models that can interact with other agents. And this could include other language models, cloud data, emails, multimedia, et cetera. They could potentially also interact with uh, physical agents like robots or smart devices. Models are also going to become increasingly personalized in their interaction. So they could be tailored to a particular individual or a particular organization. So these different emerging paradigms bring up a lot of open questions around how we could build them to be more reliable. So let's consider this scenario where we are building an interactive research assistant that could help me work efficiently. And it's augmented with a range of tools and utilities that I use on a daily basis. Um, I'll walk you through some interesting research problems that we could tackle here. So let's say I'm requesting this research assistant some paper recommendations about a particular research topic. In this case, the model could potentially interact with semantic scholar or model repositories like Hugging Face to respond back to me. And these external agents could actually provide some fine-grained feedback to guide the model's response. So for example, the model could learn to generate a response based on a complex reward model, which takes into account whether a paper uploaded the model to the Hugging Face Hub. So more generally, I'm interested in how we can use complex multi-agent feedback to improve the model's response. Building on that same example from before, I could also request the model to change its response based on some metric that I care about. So um, for example, uh, we want the model, uh, let's say I want the model to change how it ranks different papers based on the number of downloads from Hugging Face Hub. So here we want the model to record this kind of natural language feedback so that its long-term behavior changes in its future interactions with, with the user. And this kind of interaction uh, would also be valuable when we are trying to debias the model or correct model hallucinations and factual inconsistent, uh, inconsistencies. Finally, um, we could also ask the model for um, a, a, a query like this, where we are asking it to summarize conversation over a long period of time. And this basically requires the model to use explicit memory. Uh, it needs to efficiently store the historical conversation it's had with me, as well as some of the uh, interaction history with different tools. And it should be able to retrieve uh, accurately from this uh, external memory in order to improve its response to the user. So this kind of model memory, as well as the augmentation with a bunch of different agents, could also help the model improve its accuracy uh, sorry, it's factual accuracy and reduce the number of hallucinations that it's making. So um, more generally, I'm excited about several different directions that we could take to build more reliable and interactive language models that could potentially um, foster our own uh, work potential. It could also enrich our lives. And um, I'd like to conclude here, uh, thank my collaborators of the different organizations um, and then open the floor to questions about my prior work as well as some, as well as the future directions. Right. Thank you, Bhagavi. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you. Questions, Noah. Sorry, I think I hit the wrong emoji. I don't have a question. <laughs> All right. 
But Gabby, let me just ask, just on your future work, um, th th those are really exciting future directions. Um, are there particular environments or application scenarios or whatever that come to mind when you think about uh, sort of pursuing those? Yeah, so um, some of the applications that I'm thinking of with, with respect to my first future direction, which is um, I think I, I refer to multi-agent feedback. Um, I, I talked about my last work where I was using um, a small set of tools and a relatively small set of um, complex tasks that I, I was showing how we could generalize to. And what I'm really interested in is taking this step a step further. Uh, a lot of the recent work that has explored um, augmentation and tool use has, for the most part, focused on single turn interactions with uh, a user. And what I'm really interested in is how models could be augmented um, to interact with a user over several turns. And this potentially makes the planning problem quite hard. So in the planning problem, the task is to figure out, given this user request, how do I decompose it and how do I use different tools? Um, and over several turns, uh, keeping track of the conversational history so far, this kind of planning problem can be very intricate and complex. So I think that's an interaction, that's a specific application or interaction scenario that I'm interested in, where this idea of using multi-agent feedback um, to improve the model's response over several turns would be very valuable. Um, and the same scenario could also be useful when we are investigating um, how we can uh, have longer conversations with the model. So in this case, um, when we are conversing with the model over several turns, we could also be doing it in different sessions. And all of this requires us to be thinking about how we are going to store history, historical conversation with the model and um, how we are going to be able to efficiently retrieve from it and potentially um, even update the model lazily with the, some of the uh, external memory that we are where we are retaining the history conversation. So again, in that scenario also, um, uh, the multi-turn and multi-session interaction uh, application will be, I think, a good test bed to test out um, stateful language models. All right, thank you. Hi, I have a question. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I Sorry if this is sort of basic, maybe I missed it, but can you talk a little bit more about how in the third piece of work that you talked about, um, <clears throat> you, the, the like tool library um, was created? And I think also a couple times you mentioned how within this framework, it enables people to interact or like correct what the model is doing. But I didn't, I don't think I saw you talk about like examples of that or um, I don't know, like, okay, yeah, uh, I can, yeah maybe sure. those two things are over. connected. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I can go over how um, uh, people were able to debug and correct the model. I think I covered them in a, briefly in the last couple of slides. So maybe, maybe I can go over them again. So um, here the people are shown the program that was generated by our framework, and they can basically add or edit sub steps. Um, so uh, I think I showed you this example where in the physics question answering task, they realized that there were two other sub-steps that were missing in the decomposition, right? Um, like adding a unit of measurement or rounding off the answer. And so this, uh, the, the highlighted edit portion is where the humans added in these additional steps. And they only did it for a, a few instances for this task. And so uh, that's that's where we show that, you know, our, our framework could, there's a loop here where we could feed the program back to the user for, for them to examine and edit. And then when this is prompted back to the model, we, we see that massive gain over the different tasks that we did this uh, experiment with. OK, great. So then here, I guess, um, can you talk a little bit more about, so this is like correcting five instances. So that means like, um, I guess I'm, I'm not, I still don't totally understand what this plot is showing. So the um, I like the massive gains. That's great, obviously. Um, I think it's showing that like out of, all of the examples from, um, let's say, one of these, uh, like temporal sequences, uh -huh. 
there are five that the model got wrong and a person corrected out of the whole test set. And so then once it corrected those five, we saw this large gain. Is that is that right? That's right. I mean, there could have been more than five that uh, the model got wrong, but we, we chose five errors um, randomly uh, from the test set. And um, actually, not from the test set, from the if there was training data available, then we chose it from the training data. Otherwise, like some of these big bench tasks didn't have a, a, an explicit training data. So we then chose it from the test set. So that's why we limited it to just five. Um, and then we, we obviously left out those five from the evaluation. Um, and then, yeah, then report results on the original test set with potentially leaving out those five examples if necessary. And that's where we see that game. So the Got five it. examples were randomly chosen from the errors made by the model. And the five examples, like, I think just to make sure I understand, so the way that a person corrected them was similar to what you showed on the last stage where they added, they like manually added yes. in English sentences describing different steps that they thought the model could use to get to the answer, and then those steps were added to the tool library? Uh, so they were added. So you know, once you edit the program, you essentially get a new program for the task. So what we do is we augment the, the task or the program library. Um, and in this particular iteration of the project, um, the different steps that are added, like Roundup or AddUnit, are handled by the original language model. They're not handled by um, another additional tool. I mean, the user could potentially define logic that you know rounding up requires using code generation once again. But at least in this limited scenario, we um, the, the new steps and tools that are being introduced by the users are default handled by the language model itself and not by some other additional utility. Um, but potentially, you're right in that we could also let the users expand the number of tools and add additional examples to uh, for how to get, for example, the round up tool to work better across a bunch of other tasks as well. I see. I, I guess I'm just like uh, I'm just trying to understand how it works. So that's totally fine. So the so here, like round up answer to the nearest integer. I guess so. In the let's say the training data for one task it'll be the task will be broken down into these different steps. And then if there's a mistake or like the, the model doesn't round up to the nearest integer, then you can, a person can edit it and literally just type round up to the nearest yeah. integer. And then hopefully the language model will. Yeah. And, and it's then that's now your training instance, which you train on instead of the training instance that had been broken down just by the machine. Exactly. Um, I think the other difference here is uh, in the original scenario, I'm we are, we are trying to do zero shot generalization. So the um, like if you uh, remember, uh, the way this works is that we first select programs from the task library, which are not going to be physics QA tasks. They are going to be some of the tasks that are already present in the task library. Um, and we want to generalize to physics QA uh, based solely on its input. But when we get to the human annotation step, we are editing programs of the physics QA task directly. So in that case, the uh, the prompt now will contain examples from the physics QA task. Whereas initially, um, when I was reporting these results and comparing against our sorry baseline uh, baselines, here we are trying to generalize to a new task given just the library tasks. Got it. Okay, and the library tasks also. Those are just are those those are automatically created. <laughs> uh, those are authored. Like some of the yeah. fifteen tasks, yeah, we we do author programs for the for the tasks that are already present in the task library. Got it. And then I guess like the other question I have here is like if I were to if somebody were to ask me to author tasks like that, um, I'm not totally sure how I would do it. Like I don't know exactly how I would break down some of these tasks to be step by step. So can you talk a little bit about how maybe you talked a little bit about that too, I don't know, but can you talk a little bit about how you authored those and like what best practices there are? Yeah, so uh, let me go through some of the uh, this is not a uh, comprehensive uh, setup of how we did this, but I can walk you through them. So I think the key was identifying um, a large set of tasks that could potentially cover different skills that the language model could learn. So in that, uh, to design that, we chose a, 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 big, a, a benchmark like Big Bench, and then because we wanted to uh, 
test our scenario, uh, our training um, and uh, evaluation scenario for a limited set of skills. Um, we, we just chose these four skills that have coverage over almost half the Big Bench benchmark. So a lot of these skills are important to a, to a lot of different tasks in Big Bench, like searching for information, arithmetic, et cetera. And so then um, once we'd isolated, OK, these are the four skills, we randomly chose tasks from Big Bench that required these skills. So there, there wasn't. Um, we weren't trying to curate some of the most difficult tasks to be in the in the library and some of the easy tasks to be in the test set. No, I, this was very randomly selected. Um, so then, how do we break down and write the program? So this was basically an effort uh, where all of my collaborators we sat down um, and looked at the different uh, inputs, um, potential uh, complexities of different problems, and adopted this uh, program format that um, I talked about, which yeah. um, it I is guess, yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I guess like maybe the maybe the question I meant to ask is like <clears throat> here for just one of these, like what you've got this like arrow in the box there, I would imagine um, maybe elementary math QA is pretty, I, I imagine that you and I would come up with similar strategies for how to do that. But for some of these, um, like something related to fallacies or um, I don't know, anachronisms, I don't know what music is, but uh, I would imagine that without really clear instructions, then you and I might come up with very different ways of breaking this down. So that's really the sort of question I wanted to ask yeah. is like, th this doesn't seem super clear always. It seems like sometimes it might be hard to do this sort of breakdown and creation of the library. Yeah. So I think what was valuable in the design of this framework was to have this high level skill that we wanted uh, the model to generalize to. So that anchored how we authored the different programs. So in the case of the search skill, for example, the consistent format that would be valuable is to have the model issue queries to Google search. And the breakdown, therefore, should be, uh, the breakdown is based on you know, where these queries are required, where the additional information lookup is required. Uh, similarly, in the arithmetic tasks, it's about being able to figure out where the ad additional arithmetic is required and how do we um, get the model to generate the right arithmetic. So because we were being anchored by these overall skills that the model has to learn, the breakdown or the potential space of programs that we could write was then constrained because we were focused on getting the model to learn that particular skill. Does that uh, answer? Yeah. yeah, I think that helps, yeah. All right, we have time for one very la very quick last question. Anybody wants to jump in? All right. Well, um, in that case, Bhagavi, uh, your time is perfect. You did uh, left just the right amount of time for questions at the end. Again, thank you for the super interesting talk. Uh, really you. exciting work. You've covered a lot of ground in your thesis, and uh, um, uh, it's really interesting to hear it. Uh, let's give Bagavi a round of applause again. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone.